hard in the north. <laughs> so um, obviously, Gareth, you're the main the main feature of your day to day is you're going to um, Thornhill Academy. I'm not going to say that. Okay, yeah. it was all over the Yorkshire Post today. Was it? Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Right. Oh dear. Okay, but don't tell anyone. Right. <laughs> anyway, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Gareth Unwin, the co-founder and CEO of Bedlam Productions, the producer of numerous films for TV and cinema, uh, including the excellent uh, Zaitu. Uh, and probably most famously, of course, certainly at the moment, for the, the producer of the multi-award winning uh, film, The King's Speech. So we've been running um, a project this year on historical dramas and the relationship between uh, historical dramas and the wider heritage industry and kind of, you know, memorial culture and those kinds of issues. Uh, the starting point for that project was that cycle of films in the 1980s, you know, the kind of Room with a View, um, Chariots of Fire, those kinds mm. of films, which did so much at the time for the standing of British film internationally. And in some ways, The King's Speech can be seen as a kind of reconnection, if you like, with that tradition. I guess not least because you've got people like Helena Bonham Carter and um, Derek Jacobi and people like that um, in parts of those productions. Since the success of The King's Speech, you know, those kinds of productions are all over the place now, I guess, really. You've got, um, and you know, not just in um, cinemas, but also uh, in television since the success of Downton Abbey, um, Call the Midwife, those kinds of things. You know, those kind of heritage productions are all over the place. But it wasn't really like that when you were putting The King's Speech into production. I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the project and the specific challenges you face, and perhaps still face, when you're trying to put in a kind of big um, historical drama Onto and get it onto the big screen. Sure. Afternoon. Thanks for coming. I was told it was going to be an empty room. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. Got it nerves might, now. It might have been. Um, no, I think you're right. I mean, you've identified the sort of the, the boom in the 1980s, and uh, Lord Putnam was famed for saying the British are coming. The British are coming. A, a, a riff on the Paul Revere story when uh, he picked up his Oscar. And I think that you know period drama emanating from the UK through Merchant Ivory and such such companies like that was was at a you know was at a peak and a peak that then fell off quite dramatically i mean when we were trying to put the king's speech together it was at a time where period drama wasn't in favor you know no one believed that there was the great pound audience out there that cinema was just full of you know, shows, apart from family viewing, things that were geared towards your sort of date night movie, rom-com, Friday night, um, couples event. So at the time that we were putting the show together, it was it was a difficult ask, you know, and um, one of the common questions I'm asked is how come the BBC weren't part of it, how come ITV weren't part of it, how come Channel 4 and other institutions in the UK wouldn't be part of it, and it was just the case that it wasn't the appetite of the time and I think taste is cyclical and you know what tends to happen if you do have one show that particularly pops um, you will see a lot of other films or TV shows that try to mirror or capture part of that sort of uh, part of that aura I mean one of the things that really gave me you know a huge amount of confidence in the state of the British film industry at the time that the King's Speech came out was Almost four months later, we were nearly knocked... Uh, I mean, the biggest accolade we had, apart from the prizes and all the rest of it, was that we are and still are the highest grossing British independent film of all time. And about four or five months after that, we nearly had that accolade taken away from us by the in-betweeners. You know, two <laughs> completely different films, and both proving that there is a vibrant audience out there. And that was on box office, office alone. In terms of the genesis of the project, I mean, it came to came to me through a lady called Joan Lane, who was a theatre producer, and um, she and Bedlam, which I'll, I'll talk about Bedlam in a second, but she and Bedlam were in discussion because we were trying to find something that small, little chamber piece, couple of characters, easy to mount, lowish budget, just something to, to put through the, the company. Um, and actually one of your alumni, Richard Price, mm -hmm. who is a, a, a big part of the university, I understand, and it's on his threat that I'm here, um, <laughs> from Mauritius. I don't know how he managed, how he managed to sort of um, bash me over the head with that one. But anyway, um, so basically, Joan sent us five plays. And each of the plays had this sort of very elegant log line. And the last one on that list, number five of five, was the King's Speech. And all she bothered to write next to it was, you might like it, you might not. Well, there was something in the play that was incredibly seductive. It was... Um, 
very contained. It was, if you imagine, I'm presuming most of you have seen the film or the trailer at least, so you have a sense of what the storyline is. But if you imagine distilling the whole of the film down into just the therapy sessions, that's what the play was. And we got to meet the writer. We started to discuss developing it with David. Richard Price put his hand in his pocket to a, a, a small amount to commission the first script. And we started a development process. And through that development process where we were trying to sort of unpack it from that fairly sort of constrained screenplay, a, a stage play, we started to unpick all of these wonderful little sort of sub-stories, subplots that David, the writer, had in, in his mind because originally he had actually written it as a film. Written it as a film, everyone has said this is never going to get to the screen, the only way you'll get this away is a stage play, so he packed it into lots of very tight boxes and that was the stage play. So it was a, a process of unpacking those boxes to develop it into, into the, the screenplay it became. That's the sort of creative genesis of the project. Getting people to back it, was it tricky at the time, given the fact that historical dramas weren't really in vogue? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, independent film is, is tough full stop. Um, you know, you are, you know, basically trying to persuade someone to part with a uh, not inconsiderable amount of money, speculating on the basis that what you've had as an idea could actually generate revenue. I mean, you may as well take a tenner and go to the Newmark races, Newmarket races, um, if you're looking for any more certainty. So I think independent film is always difficult. At the time, we were also faced with the fact that the Lehman Brothers collapse had happened and that had taken down a couple of the big funding facilities in the, in the state. So there's this general sense of unease at the time. And ultimately, people were finding it very difficult to get hooked on the idea of going into a cinema and listening to someone stutter for 90 <laughs> minutes. Um, you know, it's, it's not the easiest pitch in the world. But we managed to align ourselves with some, some great partners. Um, for those of you who know how in independent film comes together, basically there's a multitude of ways. There, there's people that have money that will give it to you and invest on an equity position. That means they take a stake in the film and if it does well, they profit from it. If it doesn't do well, they lose their money. Then there is what they call debt equity, which is a loan that's held against the pro production. So the producers take on a debt facility and then that gets repaid out of, out of receipts. And then you try to raise the majority, normally between 60 and 70% of the remaining finance, out of pre-sales. So we pre-sold the UK to a company called Momentum Pictures that have now been swallowed up by E1. We sold Australia to Transmission. And then Harvey swept in and took um, the US, Germany, France, Italy, Spain. And the guarantees that he offered and the other partners offered against the film gave us the money to then get into into production. So it was their, you know, it was their bravery and their insight and, and sharing our sort of common ambition that meant that, that we could get into production. It seems to be kind of inevitable, I mean across Europe really, uh, that if you have a successful film it sparks a debate about the state or the health of that particular national film industry. Right, and certainly the King's Speech sparked a whole bunch of debates when it, uh, th th through its success. One of the weirdest, bizarrest, I guess, would be, um, I don't know if you're aware of um, the comments by Niall Gardner in The Telegraph, where he was outraged by comments, well, after you, um, you guys won the Oscars, he was outraged by um, comments um, from the European Commission who was celebrating the success of the film and mentioned the fact that you'd also got some funding from uh, the media scheme, right? right? Okay. And he saw this as a, an affront to the British credentials of the film and saw this as a terrible kind of attempt by the EU to take over this quintessentially British product. Well, I suggest think. he's got too much time on his hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, wonder, I wonder, is the status, is the, is the kind of the national status of the film of any interest to you? Or is it, do you see the film as a kind of a product of a British film tradition? Because I'm, I'm thinking, I was thinking also about Zaitun yeah. and the status of that as a kind of um, British-Israeli co-production. In some yeah. ways, in that film, it's really significant that that is an Israeli film, given yeah. the subject matter, isn't yeah. it? And I wondered if that was something as, in, as well in the King's Speech that kind of played into the way you thought about well, it. Well, I mean, I think you sort of... Uh, to assess both of them separately, because I mm. think that they are, you know, very different films, but I think, and it's an incredibly... It's a incredibly facile thing to say, but I think we just caught the zeitgeist of a feeling and a mood in the nation, you know, Harvey proclaims that he had a hand in when the royal wedding was set, you know, as part of his marketing 
uh, of the film, you know, and all of the, all these. But I think we generally got, you know, the keep calm and carry on signs were in every bit of stationery. There was just this sort of sense of something happening here in the UK. Now, I was never prescient enough to be able to identify that eight years out and go, OK, I'm going to struggle and go unpaid and <laughs> toil and sweat and bleed and cry for six, seven years to get there because I know that in eight years' time suddenly everyone's going to be proud to be British again. You know, you don't. You just happen to hit that sort of alchemy. Um, I think with Zaytun, it was it was an interesting model. I mean, the great thing about the fact that we were the first production to go through the UK's Israeli co-production treaty and also that that sat alongside a, a bilateral treaty between France and Israel gave me as a producer the roadmap to how structurally and financially we could bring it together. You know, the way these sort of co-production treaties are supposed to work is that they give the producer on the opposite side access to either local funding initiatives or tax rebates or other incentives that makes it attractive for you to go to there to film. Now that wasn't really the case with the, the Israeli-UK co-production treaty, it was more of a, a cultural roadmap to help me just navigate who to speak to and, 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 and how and about what. Um, but it's funny, I always, I always sort of had them as worlds apart and then I was in a similar session about three months ago, I think, with Film Club, which is, I mean, a much younger age group than you guys and girls, but, you know, sort of like 12 to 16 year olds and this one kid stuck his hand up in the air and he said, you've made the same film twice. What? And it's like, well, you made another period bromance. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm developing an oeuvre, you know, <laughs> which was a bit of a worry. But I do see them as, as separate and similar, I suppose. <laughs> The final question I'd, I'd like to ask is again a kind of the other debate that the film sparked was about the, the health of the, the British film industry and about the funding landscape. And this was kind of your film was seen as the last hurrah, wasn't it, for, for the UK Film Council? Yeah. Uh, how healthy is contemporary British cinema? And what's your prognosis, prognosis for uh, God, the BFI? Uh, and, Dr Ellis Unwin. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think the BFI in its new incarnation is good news. I think. Um, who they've identified as key personnel that existed in the former organisation who they've taken across is really good news. Um, I think in Ben Roberts you have someone who has an eye not only to the art form but also you know, the business side of things. He comes from a, a sales background, so that's, that's, this is the current head of the pre what used to be the Premier Fund. Um, I think the BFI are very proactive in terms of developing international relations and, you know, you will have read a couple of weeks ago, I think, that um, one of the ministers from the DCMS was out in the States, sort of, you know, not fundraising, but sort of raising the profile of British film. Um, I think, you know, you only have to look at the amount of film that is being made um, and the fact that that sits alongside, you know, some really significant international <coughs> productions. And I don't want to get into sort of, you know, yank bashing or anything, but there are some really big shows that choose to come and shoot in the UK because of the quality of the labour, the craftsmanship, the heritage, the facilities that we have here. And that, that's not to be poo-pooed for the sake of art. But when you also have, you know, a, a really strong sub, sort of one and a half million pound um, sector that is producing hundreds of films a year, I think that shows that the production side is very buoyant. I think you know, if I'm going to take a holistic view, where I think we are struggling a little bit at the moment is that we are a little bit behind the curve in terms of cross-platform, cross-media exploitation and, you know, I mean, you may have discussed a field, for, a field in England as part of your, your studies, but that went day and day across all platforms and with some fairly sort of avant-garde thinking. Um, I also think that, you know, that we sometimes lose sight to to our, our, our sort of path to market and that sounds like a horrible sort of carpet salesman term but you know I can make a film because I want to go and see it and that's fine that's my my passion but if I'm borrowing money using other people's money using state money to try and get a film together then surely I have a responsibility to believe that there is a genuine market there for it now you know a market and audience can be 20 people can be 200 people could be 200,000 2 million or whatever but you know you have to feel that you're making it for someone that's going to, to want to sort of to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, 15, one five, just in case anyone at the back gets, <laughs> I'll suddenly get mugged on the way out to the car park. Um, so yeah, it's made $15 million, sort of 9.2 million quid. 
Um, we arrived at that number. I'm, I used to be a line producer. That's what I used to do for five years is run budgets, run films. And I took the script, broke, broke it down. We were able to do some really modest above the line deals. You know, I don't think you'd be able to get away with that type of budget on this type of film again but that shows how much they loved the material the below the below the line budget on it was about four and a half million ster four and a half to five million sterling and if you think about the film there's some really big set pieces in there I mean Wembley Arena um, you know some big street scenes and when you see a scene like for example when just when Logue's arriving back at the the, the house and it's fog bound you know the cost of clearing a street like that in London paying all the neighbours, clearing the cars, repainting the lines, laying cobbles, then flooding it with, with smoke, you know, it's not surprising where this money goes. I remember, again, in a similar a similar sort of session with Farnborough College, one of the guys stuck his hand in the air and he was like, well, do you think, I think Gareth Edwards had just made Monsters for £50,000. And he said, <coughs> the question was, do you think your film is, whatever the quantum, whatever the multiple was, is that many times better than his film? I said, of course not. They're completely different <laughs> movies. Um, but I think, you know, I think we, it seems like a massive number. I know that that seems like a massive number. But when you look to, you know, Pride and, Preju Pride and Prejudice of Twice, that we've just seen Great Expectations, Mike Newell's film, that was that plus again about 50%. Uh, atonement was significantly higher. So I think we made it at the right price point. Mm. And uh, you mentioned that Harvey pitched all to a few foreign territories, yeah. uh, which is normally the role of a sales agent, yeah. I think Film Nation in your case. Yeah. Um, when became Film Nation involved? Uh, were they only involved in the post-production stage, or uh, well, Harvey was taking care of pre-sales and pre-production stage? Yeah. The reason that that came about was that it is, <coughs> with, the producer, with the producers and the money, it's a sliding scale. If you give away absolutely everything, then everyone else recoups ahead of you. If you are clever in your structuring and you manage to retain certain territories where you do the deals yourselves, then you avoid the sales agent commissions on, on that. So we had, a strong, we had strong relationships in the UK, strong relationships in Australia. Um, Film Nation had come in for the rest of the world and it was just part of the negotiation with, with Harvey and what he wanted to take that that balance was, was struck. So it wasn't that one was in before before the other. Mm. Does that make and any sense? When they, they came on board? In Harvey came in about, uh, it was in pre-production. This was production. before we closed finance. So Harvey came in, he was the third party in. So it went um, Momentum, Transmission, Harvey, BFI, and Film Nation were already part of it. And that. What was it like working with him? I mean, he's got such a formidable reputation. It's really good. I think they, I think, the Weinstein Company as a whole worked really hard to protect that myth. In reality, um, you know, he is... Look, I think... I can't remember who's, who's, who said it. I remember when we were on the award circuit, someone said, look, you'd rather the business with Harvey in it and knowing he's there, because he does have eclectic taste. He will take a punt. He will go the extra yard. And it's a case of sort of better the devil you know. But he, you know, he, he really left us alone. I think he had confidence in... Tom, the director, he you know recognised that the cast was formidable, um, saw in us as as young producers that we knew what we were doing on budget and schedule and and the packaging side of things. So it wasn't too bad. There was a there's a little moment when we first did the sort of Midwest tests where we sort of went in and we screened. I mean, middle of nowhere in the Midwest of the states because we just didn't know whether they were going to get the the tone of the stutter, what was going on and the sort of political landscape and just get the, the story and it tested through the roof and I think from that point on he really did sort of leave, leave us alone and it was all about what could he then do to support the film through the rest of its life. Mm. When you put a film together what you tend to do is to try and identify ten mm. comps and the ten comps normally you try and sit within a five year window before you're going into production because the thing is, these, these sort of questions come up, you know, how are you going to make sure you're not an X, Y or Z film? And so you need to have your arguments ready. I think there was, um, there's a sense of, a sense of wariness, but we were never fearful. I know that sounds like a, a sort of, you know, clever grammatical way of saying it, but it's just, we were aware of it, but we weren't afraid of it. We still had the courage of our convictions and the responses we were getting from, you know, the cast we were going to and coming back, 
you know, Guy Pearce, who at that point was, you know, everyone wanted him and he was quite happy to come in for what was basically five days on a British independent mm. film. You know, the fact that the cast were responding so well, that gave us a sort of confidence, mm. I think. Uh, that's because it, it, I think the King's Speech was a very attractive project for distributors in pre-production and production states, but became extremely popular in the post-production states. Can you explain? Well, what happened was is that's when you start to get into some very clever marketing. I mean, the through the post, you know, word was starting to get out that we thought that we, you know, we we always thought we had something special from the beginning. So the fact that this was confirmed during the shooting period, during the editing, and as we get it, start to get ready for, for the release. Where it went nuts was, and I remember the weekend, and it's, uh, it's a way that, that a couple of other films have broken. For example, Slumdog did it the year before us, where they did a very small little independent film festival called Telluride, which is non-industry, there's no market around it, there's no sales, it is literally just for cineasts. And that's a sort of, it's a buzz generator. And because Toronto then falls the week after, it's a great launch pad to go into Toronto, which is a much bigger, shoutier festival, which have, um, you know, audience awards and, and some such. And it was coming off the back of Toronto that I think we really started to feel that sort of buzz. And, and a lot of the sort of, the deals that weren't required to get us into production, a lot of those deals fell after Toronto and people had actually seen the film, you know, and they're, there's stories of buyers and agents like leaving the film halfway through to go and start making offers, even though they hadn't seen the end of the movie. You know, it's a bit of a nonsense, really. You know, <laughs> suddenly Godzilla turns up in the yeah, last yeah. reel or something. But. <laughs> um, thanks very much. This is really useful, really interesting stuff, actually. But I'm, I'm just wondering. Um, the connections, uh, you, you, you seem to be telling us quite a lot about how to raise money in general and particularly around this project, um, as in some ways as if it's kind of divorced from the content. I know that's not the case, so I'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit more about, um, uh, and if you've got any opinions about how the industry shapes content. Right. Um, I, I mean, I'm thinking here you've got um, a situation where you've got, you've, you've got a project, you're explaining you've got a project which was originally conceived of as a film, became a stage play, perhaps was a, a small thing. You've explained a little about how people began to get the alchemy working, but as it was beginning to develop in terms of um, story development and so on, is there a how, how would you say things are <coughs> as opposed to you, the artistic The artistic side, involvement. Yeah. No, I think, I think I've fallen into the producer's neurosis of, how, oh, sorry, how are you going to make it ha happen and how do you help other producers sort of see the structure? Um, so I'm sorry if I sort of just jumped in on the, on the financial. I mean, the creative development of the project was a real gift. I mean, we had in the writer, David Seidler suffered with a terrible stutter through all of his, his youth. And he was part of, part of the mass emigration to the States at the start of the Second World War. And it was the speeches of King George V, God, it's been that long, I've forgotten, <laughs> um, that he used to listen to on the radio that gave him confidence as a, as a, as a young man to be able to sort of deal with his, his stammer and his stutter. So with him, we had this, this gold mine that as we sort of tested areas of the story and tried to open it, open it up, you know, he would be able to call, to call to mind all of these great examples that would just sort of really fit the bill. Um, there was another sort of really amazing moment, fortuitous moment. Uh, it's become sort of part of the King's Speech myth, as it were, and I don't know whether, whether you've heard of this, but when we started to, to develop it with David, David remembered that he had actually got in touch with the Logue family. 40, 45 years earlier when he had first started thinking about doing the, the, the screenplay. And we managed to, through sort of six degrees of separation, track down the son of Valentine. And Valentine is the one who's studying to be the doctor in, 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 the, in the film. And he, we discovered, had a surviving son who was living and working in London. So it was one of our art department. We were, we were looking for... Um, just some p photos to populate like Logue's um, treatment rooms and to sort of give us a sense of his sort of fam familial backstory. 
And three weeks out from the shoot, this art department runner went to Mark Logue's house and said, oh, have you got anything of your great-great-grand... Great-great-grandfather? Yeah, great-great-grandfather. And he said, oh, there's a box up in the loft that we've nev never really touched since mum and dad went back to Australia. Brings it down, there's a musty sort of tea towel over the top of it, and in that box is Logue's diaries. So all through the period of time when he was treating Bertie, mm -hmm. he was keeping some fairly extensive notes. Never shared them, never published them, never profited them from them. They were literally his case notes. And as we started to read these, there's these wonderful lines of dialogue that started presenting themselves. So the swearing, that, that scene, which is a wonderful scene that, that comes at about an hour in, that's a truism. Lowe got Bertie to do that. The line where he says, um, you're a bit tubby, you know, that's a line that Logue had down in his diaries. The line about the smoking and the fact that he'd been advised to smoke because it was help and idiots, they're knighted, well, goes to prove it then. All of that came out of the, the diaries. And that was a really... I've, I mean, I've never come across something like that when you find such an impressive artefact so close to production. I mean, it actually put us into a bit of a tailspin because we're suddenly, how do we try and work all of this in but not derail all the wonderful prep work that's happened before? Um, so I think... On the creative development, one, the gold mine that we had with David, two, just our appetite for the story. I mean, you know, a story about a man that has to struggle with his difficulties and through friendships finds a course of action that leads him to redemption slash self -aid. I mean, that's brilliant storytelling. And then the, the diaries popping up three weeks before the, the shoot, you know, all of those were really important factors on the creative development. mentioned transmedia as well um, yeah I mean how did, how did you cope with that because this is a very if you like traditional way of uh, telling a story through a single film and it's extremely successful in what it in the way it does it yeah what about the other stuff I mean I, I think to tell you the truth our, our film isn't the greatest model or case study to look at when you're talking about trans, transmedia or, I got it wrong the other I said it again today cross platform it hasn't been cross platform for about three years has it um, <laughs> But, you know, we, we did follow a very, very classic theatrical first window, rolling it out, US goes first, UK follows, break out through, through, through Europe. We did a platform <coughs> release in the, in the States, which meant we started on four screens, two in LA, two in New York, on um, one of their big holidays, I think, Martin Luther King Hot Weekend or Veterans Weekend, um, which was when we launched the film, and then just built the release out um, but this was never one of those films that's really going to be in that sort of, you know, you couldn't do what ben, ben did with the field in England where, you know, iPad, phone, SVOD, VOD, you know, digital TX and cinemas at the same, same time. Um, I just don't think it was, it was that sort of film. Sure. Well, the first, I mean, when we first got the script, you know, and you read 60-year-old speech therapists, Australian, yeah. right, okay, we're a bit of a sort of limited range here, Geoffrey Rush. Um, <laughs> and it turned out that, and Geoffrey was the first one in, the lady who brought us the, the original stage play had an assistant who lived two doors down from Geoffrey in, in Canberra or Sydney, where I can't remember which one he's, he's in. And we just thought, we'll have an absolute punt. Let's just put the stage play through his front door with a little note. And I, all I can say is I cannot advise anyone to do that. You will ruin your reputation with every agent across the globe. However, um, it did work for us. And I, I got this three-page email from his agent about how I was an idiot. I'd gone outside the process. What was I thinking? I've put her in an awkward position. But the last line was, but Jeffrey likes it. We should talk. Um, <laughs> So Jeffrey was one of the, fir the first ones in. And this is where you start to get into this really sort of like this plate spinning exercise of who works, who works creatively, who works for the financiers, who's available, what windows do you have people. And you start to add those spinning plates. And we're really quite brave with some of our choices. I mean, so, so Jeffrey was in, in first. Um, Colin was on a list of two or three and by the time we'd sort of run availabilities, got scripts out, they'd met with, with, with Tom, Colin was, you know, the prime candidate. And then we had to cast Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and we'd always had Helena Bonham Carter in mind right from the outset and we then got in touch with her agent and the window that we were looking at shooting at, she was right in the middle of production on Harry Potter. 
And so the line producer was saying, this is a no-go. The bonding agent was going, this is ridiculous. The first AD was tearing his hair out. We'd never be able to make it work. But Tom and the, and the producers, we were just really, really keen on her. So we are almost like this estranged parent where she'd go off and play with Warner Brothers for five days in the week and then we'd get her at weekends. <laughs> so we had to build our schedule around the fact that we could only have Helena at weekends Jeffrey, who had been in right from the very beginning, then decided he wanted to do a play in the new year, which meant we actually had this window that was just shrinking and shrinking. We ended up shooting him out into like 24 days. Nuts. Um, so those were the sort of the three mainstays. And then it was... And that, that was more sort of producer, producer and director-led. And then you fall into the more sort of historical way of casting, which the director engages with the casting director. You'll put forward suggestions and you sort of you give your top three and then the director meets with them and that sort of comes down but we, we were really lucky I mean Jennifer Ely, Derek Jacobi um, and a lot of actors that have now not gone on to do other things but you know I, I keep on sort of like watching BBC drama there was a, a thing called um, What Remains and it was the guy who was the theatre director in the scene with Geoffrey Rush on stage and I was like oh, what's his name Bamba so you see we keep on seeing these King Speech people pop up all mm. over the place. She mentioned um, the Queen's mother. Yeah. Is it right that the sort of film was put back, or she basically said not in her lifetime? Yeah. Um, as part of the initial development process, David Sider had written to the palace, and um, he got a handwritten note back that said. Yes, it's a story that should be told, but please not in my lifetime. The memories are still too painful. Um, I don't know whether David's quite the royalist to have actually waited her out, but I just think it actually took that long to, <laughs> for the film to come round and go into production. But, but yeah, no, that's a truism. How sort of important for you as a producer, though, was the relationship with the royal family? You know, you, you were going to... Yeah, well, whether I was going to get carted off to the tower. Or well, something. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, was it like, <laughs> I think. Do you have any sense that it was important to keep them on side? And well, they, they, in some ways, the, the easiest thing is that they will not engage with any dramatic work based around either them or their, their family history. They will do documentaries, they will allow you to film in their locations, they will allow you to enter their archives for factual research, but anything that is a dramatic telling of them or any part of their family, they just have this blanket, can't do anything. So we were working blind a little bit, and then there was, um, I think it, we were about two weeks into the release, and the son mentioned that someone had said to someone that the Queen had seen it, seen it and enjoyed it, and we were sort of like, you know, there's a little bit of a phew, mm. not off to the Tower of London then. Um, but we actually, one of the lovely things about the, the, the film, we got invited back to Buckingham Palace, because Buckingham Palace has a film club. And it's none of the royals, it's just the people that work there, and the, you know, the guards, and the the butlers and servants, but they have this little film club and they put on a film every couple of weeks and we're the only film that's ever been programmed more than once. So they asked us to go down and to do a sort of Q&A session like this and it was really, really weird, sitting in a room which has got the royal balcony above you thinking, okay, yeah, not in Kansas now, Dorothy, are we? <laughs> primary source documents, you know, diaries and things like that. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about how you use kind of research and historians' work and and really how important historical accuracy is versus that entertainment value, how you right. strike that Where balance. you strike that balance. Yeah. Well, we were very fortunate. We had, um, we had two historical advisors that we were working with, um, one of which had just released his big, big book on uh, the Elizabeth Queen Mother herself. So that was just rich with, with loads of period accuracy. Um, I think there's, there's certain things that you end up agreeing mutually are the really important things. It's almost like you'd, you'd sort of give it sort of three or four tiers. There's the stuff that you absolutely can't get wrong because you just get hauled over the coals. There's the stuff that a little fudge is okay. And then you get into the will people notice and the final one is will they actually care, you know, so we had slightly the wrong shade of corgi, I'm sure, or something like that, and that you can sort of go away with. But if you go, for example, you know, the, the scene at the very end of the film, that balcony, you know, every pleat in the front of that, that canopy on the front of that VFX shot was accurate to the real thing, because we think that's in such our sort of common knowledge of what that balcony looks like, because we've seen it at every royal wedding and event. So 
there's those bits. But people will always sort of pick you up on on certain things. You know that I think that one person rose in and got in touch that the doors opened the wrong way in the Kennington flats because his <laughs> granny used to live there and they never did. And it was like, well, you know, the, the dramatic scene doesn't stand or fall on that it is a particular movie. moment. It is. It is a you know it is a, a movie, and I think I mean one of the one of the sort of bigger issues that we were facing at the time, just as we were on release, was that, you know, when you take a slice of, slice of history and you've only got a given running time and then you're trying to produce a dramatic work, obviously things are edited. And sometimes things are, are edited out, I'm not talking about physical editing, cutting the film, but just in your, in your head, just don't appear. Um, you don't really feel that you've made a conscious decision to lose something. Um, and there was an accusation about the fact that there was, you know, less was made of the relationship that Edward had with some of the Nazi sympathisers at the time when we were going into war, and that we sort of hush hushed that because we didn't want a, a, a sort of spoiled view of the of the royal family. Well, you know, that that just wasn't in our conscious at the conscious at the time because we weren't making a documentary of the period. Um, I mean, some of the sort of the tougher things that we removed, going back to sort of creative decisions. So one of the most expensive and elaborate sequences in the film that you've never ever seen, didn't even make it into the deleted scenes, was we did George the Fourth's funeral. And we took over Greenwich for three days. We had troops, we had horses, we had carriages, we had hundreds of extras. But the problem was, is where that real event came within the timeline of our story, it meant that we we're finishing the first act and it was all about the death of King George rather than the birth of Bertie the New King. So you find yourself as a producer having to make quite a mercenary decision, which has cost you a lot of money. You must have broken your heart. Well, yeah, yeah, as an ex-line producer, it did really. I was like, oh, you know. But, um, but it had to happen, because otherwise we were just sort of, that point in the story was, was, was off. Um, just a question about producing in general. Um, how did you like get into producing? Because I know that you've done assistant directing yeah. and produ like production managing. What would be like one key piece of advice to actually get into those sort of roles? Like what process was it? Well, I think um, I do see them in two different sides of the fence. I think there's definitely there's the producer side of the fence, and then there is the production side of the fence. I think if you have an appetite to get into the production side of things, there is you know, there, there's a clear hierarchy, you know, there are grades and the easiest thing to do is to do as I did, which is go at the go in at the bottom and you work your way up and you get to a point where that's either going to really keep you happy for the rest of your working career or you're going to want to make a move. And what happened with me was, you know, I was getting to first AD, some really, really big films, you know, big budgets, big schedules, but I just realised, I just kept, because everyone is always after that little bit more or that improvement, that it was almost broken before I got involved and as someone who's a real you know both in my personal life and my professional life I'm a problem solver so if someone gives me something that's already broken I've I'm sort of struggling to try and find a way of making it work and I just got to this point where I realized that within my first ADing that you know I wasn't going to go on and do bonds I wasn't going to do Harry Potter I wasn't going to work at that level but I was going to consistently keep getting these budgets that were too low or schedules that were too short so I thought well how do I fix that well, if I step sideways into production managing, stroke line producing, I've got a bit more control of the money, the cash flow, the time, and how you deploy those resources. And then after doing that for a couple of years, I realised actually the only way that you can have true autonomy with controlling the amount of money that's in a film is to produce, because then ultimately you've got the responsibility. You know, it's, it's up to you to make sure that your film is financed to a level that you can achieve that common vision that you have with the, the director. Um, if you want to go the producing route and you don't want to sort of slave over a hot kettle on set running teas and coffees around and do that side of things, the best, thing I, the best bit of advice I can recommend anyone that goes wants to just do the producing thing is to start with shorts, partner up with if you can find a really talented writer or director or someone that's going to give you the content because if you're trying to create at the same time as putting together, it's really, really difficult. Um, I'd say... You're in an ideal situation at the moment. I mean, what, 30,000 students, of which I don't know how many are within the media department or have an interest, but you've got, at your fingertips, a lot of very energetic, bright people. I mean, half a dozen of my most important commercial relationships were forged when I was in film school. 
I mean, my business partner is my best mate from film school, and we, we now have our own company. So I always like to sort of get people to, you know, don't necessarily worry about what's happening in two, three years when you graduate. Make sure you're using the time now to forge those relationships. It's the only time you really work within a sheltered workshop where you can make no mistakes. I mean, bar taking a camera out and going and hitting someone with it, you know. Don't do um, that. No, don't do that. That would be a bad thing. Um, you know, really try and maximise the time that you have that you have here. Speech then and making it now, how much more reliant would you be on, on digital technologies? Could you describe these incredible kind of set pieces that you put together? How would you approach the project today? Um, I think we'd give it a similar methodology. I mean, I know that the King's Speech was only four years ago, and digital filmmaking I mean, you turn around twice and there's another advancement that's come through, but people don't realise actually how VFX heavy. The King's Speech was. There's a lot. I mean, some of them are really obvious. You know, the big wides and the god shots and stuff. But there was a lot of work that went into removing the 21st century in the King's Speech. You know, for example, when we're shooting in Hyde Park, we we didn't realise until we got into a later viewing. Suddenly, you got the BT Tower in between in between the trees, and we'd been really careful about what we could do on the ground, what we were masked, what we had. We had you know things in the way, but suddenly, as soon as we sort of pan through 360 degrees there's the BT tower that sort of and it was really awkward because it's actually within <coughs> the tree line so we had to rotoscope out the trees then take the BT tower out and then put the trees back in which on, a, on a moving shot that was not stabilised it was a steady cam shot that was like two minutes long um, I think we might have, have, have in answer to your question I think you know given the opportunity we might afford ourselves a little bit bigger scale you know I think um set extension and duplication on things like sort of you know military vehicles and just some of that pomp and pageantry I think we could get a little bit bigger this time by by what could lend us um, I suppose the big question would be would we shoot digital or film um, that'd be the DP's decision I've recently done my, my second feature on uh, on an Alexa and I think an amazing bit of kit mm -hmm. just the speed at which the set turns over it's a different energy Um, I've got one final question. Feel free to say no to this. <laughs> Have you brought the Oscar with you? Yes. And can we see it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It normally sits. Um, it normally sits in the office, glaring down at the staff to remind them that they need to crack on. Um, wow! Look at that. <laughs> and the Oscar goes too. Where's that from? Great. Um, well, Gareth, thank you so much for that. Oh, my I mean, pleasure. It's been a fascinating session. I'm sure everybody's got a lot of. Um, uh, information out of that and lots of good advice to some of our students that, that are here so if we could just show our appreciation to Gareth before we all dive in and have a couple of sandwiches so thank, thank you very much